Welcome back to another edition of Elevate Your Grind brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. I am your host, Todd Rosales. I don't think I've seen all of you folks since our cooking episode last week. So obviously that was a little bit different than what we usually do. We wanted to integrate hemp as a nice dietary supplement to our meals. Um, for some of you are probably expecting some kind of infused cooking show. We will probably get to that at some point in time. But, you know, with Shadi Ramey, she had a great cookbook and we wanted to make sure that we made some nice meals for Thanksgiving. That apple crumble was legit delicious. If you haven't seen the fin the finished product, check out the Instagram and either at the Cannabis Lab or at EYG Podcast, and you can see what that finished product ended up looking like. However, don't judge it based off the one that I made. Judge it based off the ones in her cookbook, because I guarantee you I did not cook it as well as Shadi intended me to. So thank you folks for joining. Um, it's always fun doing this podcast. We've got three shows for you this week. We've got a great guest today. Tomorrow, my good friend Steve Ernest will be here with us. And then on Thursday at 6.30 p.m., we have the founders of Tucana are going to be with us. We've got some more amazing shows uh, for you for the rest of the year. And then next week, I'm very excited. We've got one show because it is Thanksgiving, so we're only going to be live on Tuesday. However, we might do a special episode live on location on Friday. But on Tuesday, we've got Sparky Rose. Check that out at 6.30. That's going to be at facebook.com slash business group. We've got a few panels coming up. Check those out. Join clab.com. We have some on getting hired in the industry, on staffing, on employment in the industry. Should be some great panels. Those are going to be brought to us by our partner, Blaze Staffing. Um, we had some great recordings that came out this week. Dan Berman of Cannabis BPO. We had Amy Renault and Nick O'Dilly from HBK. Um, and then the other one was Dr. Chandra Macia. So three great interviews. You can check those out on our YouTube, youtube.com slash elevate your grind. All right. Now that we have all the housekeeping out of the way, I'm very excited about our guest today because he was one of the first people to get involved, or at least the company was one of the first to get involved in the legal cannabis market, especially on the CBD side. And the name of the company, uh, you might recognize it, is Medical Marijuana Inc. So please welcome today's guest, the CEO of Medical Marijuana Inc., Dr. Stuart Titus. Doctor, thanks for joining us. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you all today. Oh, the pleasure is all ours. I've seen you on CNBC, on ABC, on every major news outlet. So I appreciate you slumming it with us here today. And so I, I want to understand because, you know, so you are a doctor and you have a very interesting background. You have an, a background in healthcare and finance. Um, and I believe you started out in finance. How do you make that transition between the two? Because I've seen doctors who go the other route and then get into finance, just, you know, investing their own money, they're kind of forced into it. But you went from make, you know, from investing to then helping people. And now on the leading edge of, I wouldn't say leading edge of medicine, but you're on the forefront of it with something that's not officially recognized yet that you're trying to get there. So give us a little bit of the, the cliff notes version of your history here. Well, again, thank you so much for the opportunity and great to be on the show today. Um, I did start my career on Wall Street. I was an 11-year veteran. Uh, I was in the bond, uh, the fixed income side. I was a bond trader and underwriter. Uh, Credit Suisse First Boston was where I spent most of my career and certainly uh, had a tremendous experience in the financial markets. Uh, being a young kid, it was certainly amazing to see the tremendous uh, amount of activity on a daily basis, not only in the stock market, but also in the U.S. government and other bond markets. And uh, over time though, 11 years on Wall Street, the New York lifestyle, the fast pace, the stress, the burnout uh, really uh, got to me. And uh, I went uh, in searching of a, a new career. A uh, good friend from college was actually the head physical therapist on the PGA golf tour. And he was doing very some cool. very unique work with a low level electrical stimulation technology called microcurrent therapy and getting some phenomenal results with uh, some of the you know, top pros on the PGA Tour, and then many other athletes were coming into his office for these uh, treatments. So I was uh, so enthralled with it, and uh, Paul uh, Callaway was his name. He was so nice to take me under his wing a little bit to give me some uh, tutelage and direction into uh, getting into the physical therapy business. And uh, honest to gosh, uh, just uh, found such great uh, pleasure in helping people uh, in a much different way than what I was doing on Wall Street. Of course, on Wall Street, we were building uh, schools and toll roads, bridges, et cetera. And here you're working with individuals who are in uh, pain and uh, suffering with uh, post-surgical issues, et cetera. And to be able to help them in a, 
uh, in a wonderful way with the new technology, which at the time had only been available to the professional sport and Olympic athletes. And I was one who helped to bring it to the general public. Uh, so I certainly uh, had a, a terrific career and all, but uh, then moved out to California in 2011 to take part of this uh, evolutionary move into the non-psychoactive world of cannabis-based products. And uh, particularly uh, hemp and CBD was certainly uh, something that was in the forefront of this group out in California that I'd been involved previously with just as an investor. And uh, when they told me their plans to uh, bring a nutritional supplement, a dietary supplement form with a non-psychoactive cannabis product to US and world markets, I was just thrilled to be part of it. I'd done previous uh, research on cannabinoids and certainly attended some medical cannabis symposiums to supplement my knowledge and understanding of these uh, cannabinoids, but no one had really produced a CBD or a non-psychoactive cannabinoid in a high enough concentration uh, where people could utilize it on a daily basis. So I thought, gosh, what a great pathway, of course, the drug pharmaceutical opportunities, but also in terms of dietary supplement and just uh, people being able to use this product for health and wellness on a daily basis. We really thought these were vital and essential nutrients that would support uh, people's higher levels of overall health and wellness. And when you marry that alongside the study and research on the internal endogenous cannabinoid system within the human body, all of a sudden now you have a tremendous uh, winning formula that uh, people who are using uh, these products for uh, immune support or for improving their overall levels of health and wellness are really seeing some tremendous benefit. The market has grown exponentially. There's so many companies now selling CBD products and it's tremendous just to be part of this uh, evolutionary move. It, it's incredible. And, you know, for, for someone who's been a fan of the plant and advocate for the plant for a long time, I, at first when the CBD wave hit, I was like, all right, that's cool. That, that's something nice. And then I realized in order, it was kind of like a, a first impression of the world of cannabis to everybody else, right? Because you have reefer madness for so long that has this major stigma around cannabis as a whole, that it was a easy way by taking out the psychoactive component to get people to at least take a look at it, right? Like, hey, this is going to help you from a medical standpoint. Well, I don't want to touch that because it's going to get me high. No, it, it, it's not. This is, this is literally something that has been isolated out in order to do the, the thing that you needed to do, as you said, it's more of a dietary supplement or a nutraceutical along those lines. I see so much potential for this plant as a whole when you have, you'll have a very small kind of recreational adult use. You'll have a larger, more wellness component to it and then a full on medical component for it. And we talk on this show a lot about the adult use side and a little bit on the wellness, but I, I, I think the future is is so big for wellness and medical. And that's what I'm excited to talk to you about. I mean, I know recently, you know, your company has got involved with CBN for sleep and everything else. I feel like we're right on the cusp of CBD. Um, and I know you're itching to talk and I can't wait to hear what you have to say, but I know we're right on the cusp with CBD, but I feel like there's so much more that we have to go that CBD is really just the tip of the iceberg of all the things that we're going to see from this plant that people are going to benefit from long-term. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, certainly, we are just barely scratching the surface. Uh, many of us are now uh, in our society very aware of THC. Of course, it's been around since uh, the mid-1960s and a uh, popular form. The Vietnam protesters and all were big uh, cannabis users. And uh, of course, many people are getting great uh, medical use. It's so fab fabulous for me to see some of the recent states coming online, uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, I believe 19 and 21 different medical uh, indications for use uh, for cannabis. So uh, certainly uh, that market has uh, grown exponentially and uh, we're, we're very excited about the fact that 35 US states now have medical cannabis laws on their books. Uh, on the non-psychoactive side, we're equally uh, impressed because uh, now study and science and research has identified 150 different cannabinoids and many of these are non-psychoactive, such as CBD uh, would be, uh, or considered very technically, you might consider it non-intoxicating because it does have some anti-anxiety or what they call anxiolytic effects, just taking down anxiety. Technically, that might be considered psychoactivity to some who are very uh, strict by the letter of definition, but uh, certainly non-intoxicating forms of uh, cannabis. Mm -hmm. Some of these progressive plant growers are growing some 
uh, of the minor cannabinoids in a much larger uh, commercially available size and quantity. And uh, to take advantage of some of these uh, up and coming uh, cannabinoids, I think has uh, got some great uh, opportunity and potential for study and research to find out exactly how these cannabinoids are affecting uh, individuals. I mean, myself personally, I've been on CBD now uh, every day for the past eight years. I overcame a tremendous nerve related disorder uh, myself and uh, had a phenomenal bit of success when conventional medicine really had let me down. And now that we have CBN, I've even found I'm one step uh, further along the rung, interestingly enough, uh, because the complementary effects of these two cannabinoids are working with each other. I've just seen some uh, very good uh, results in the past few weeks just by uh, using uh, CBN at night and CBD uh, during the day. So um, when we have much more of these uh, minor cannabinoids available uh, for individuals to use and try the combinations of all the cannabinoids together themselves are going to be uh, absolutely phenomenal. And then, of course, you got all these entourage botanicals. And particularly, I'm excited about some of the flavonoids that are just available in minor concentration in the uh, hemp plant and the cannabis plant as well. But imagine if we can then grow some of these to a much higher level. For example, canaflavin A, canaflavin B, canaflavin C. These have shown 30 times the anti-inflammatory properties of aspirin in wow. of course, very small limited studies because just unfortunately limited quantities are available. But imagine say 10 years down the road, well, someone's gonna breed a plant specially and uh, potentially commercialize it and have these uh, amazing uh, you know, entourage botanicals available and you combine those with cannabinoids in a certain proportion and you might really be able to address a significant amount of uh, health and wellness conditions that are affecting us as a human uh, race. See, to me, this all seems like a natural progression of what should happen, right? In, the, in traditional medicine, a lot of things originally were derived from plants, and it was through research and development that we, we have the modern-day pharmaceuticals that we have. So why not do the same thing with cannabis, right? Especially when you have a lot of, of ailments and, and, and illnesses and all this stuff that is not being treated treated today with the with the pharmaceuticals that we have we now have this other option to explore and it's funny most of the research you hear are stories like that of people who have personal use stories and everything else you don't see a lot of widespread scientific research mainly because of the schedule one designation of of this plant but you know uh, it's weird to me, and maybe you can kind of open up on this because you're more involved in the research, obviously, than the kid with the microphone, but it seems like we need the ability to do a deep level of research with this plant, but because it's Schedule 1, we can't. So we're relying, I guess, on old, old information. We're relying on what we can get out of the University of Mississippi. We're relying on what's coming out of Israel. How do we get to a point where people like you can do the proper research in order to show the government, hey, we understand this has been a controlled substance for so long, but here are all the amazing things they can do and here are the results to prove it. How do we get to that point? Yes, it's been a very slow, uh, arduous process uh, for us in the research uh, community. Uh, certainly we're excited about doing human uh, studies and trials and it's uh, something that now with this COVID situation, it's actually uh, forcing that upon uh, the research community. They don't have a lot of very good answers for a patient who gets into the later stages and we have this tremendous cytokine storm and there are only so much in the way of steroids you can pump a patient full of to try to flush that inflammation. And it's been very interesting to see some early research with CBD on this uh, patient population that uh, CBD does seem to be more effective in certain cases than corticosteroids for flushing out this uh, inflammation, this cytokine storm as it's called. But um, even with the passage of the uh, 2018 Agricultural Improvement Act or the Farm Bill of 2018, if you will, uh, it's still been a very uh, significant challenge to do studies with live human beings, even in the CBD sector, uh, much less in the THC side, though those barriers and restrictions are slowly coming down. I know Dr. Sue Sicily, uh, for example, has been wanting to do for probably the last seven years a study on uh, individuals with PTSD, the ex-military veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder, and utilizing medical cannabis to help control some of their 
uh, anxiousness and other symptoms associated with PTSD. So certainly there are other places in the world that may be a little bit more uh, study and research friendly. Uh, we believe that Israel is certainly leading the way in terms of medical cannabis uh, study, but uh, certainly there are other uh, groups around the globe who are now utilizing CBD products and uh, doing a lot of clinical study and research. We've done a couple of studies and had some doctors doing studies and research for us in countries such as Mexico and in Brazil. And these uh, countries really accept more of a natural botanical product as a potential pharmaceutical, just uh, they have a little different way of looking at things in our FDA, which is very much uh, standardization of uh, synthetic forms of cannabinoids, et cetera. We've had a couple of uh, synthetic THC forms, uh, such as Marinol or Sesamet and Dronabinol now, the generic version, uh, being FDA approved going back to 1986, but uh, certainly not utilized widely by the general public and even uh, the uh, medical community because of the unfortunate unwanted side effects on that particular patient population. Patients, by and large, prefer the natural botanical version of cannabis because it doesn't confer the unwanted side effects, the toxic liver enzymes, et cetera, that the synthetic yeah. cannabinoids do. So that's bringing us back about 200 years in history, back to the days when you so nicely described, back when our medicines truly came from plants and all the doctors were botanists because that's where their medicine came from. It came from the plants. And uh, it's interesting to see this uh, cannabis uh, evolution, if you will, is taking us back to the plant itself just because this entourage effect is working so much better for patients and individuals than the pharmaceutically developed versions of uh, cannabis. Well, it, it's funny that you mentioned, you know, like, back, you know, way back when that, that doctors were botanists and a lot of our medicine was plant derived. So we talk about, you know, I actually, and this is just kind of a little bit of a tangent. We were having that conversation at work today. I work for um, a cannabis service provider, a company called Spring Big. And we were talking about the fact that cannabis originally was outlawed because of the fear of what the hemp plant can do to the paper industry and everything else that it actually wasn't the consumption of what they then dubbed marijuana, but the consumption of cannabis that got it outlawed. It was the fear of the billion dollar hemp plant. So I find that funny that for all these years, we've you know, kind of demonized the consumption of cannabis when the original fear was the economic impact that the plant will have. So kind of on that theme, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about leveraging cannabis for economic recovery in, in this country, right? Obviously, we have a pandemic, businesses, there are bad things happening. And if you look at the potential of cannabis, there's an opportunity to create an entire new industry, even though it's somewhat created already, but jobs and, and blue collar jobs, logistic jobs, agricultural jobs, you've got new streams of income, new tax revenue for the country. So there's a massive opportunity here. However, you had mentioned a lot of other states that are focusing on the research and they're obviously ahead of our country. Do you think that our country is potentially going to miss, I don't want to say miss the ball, but at least they're behind the eight ball in leveraging cannabis for economic recovery because all these other countries are starting to go federally illegal and they're going to they're gonna leapfrog us in this area? Well, it's, it's been great to see the movement uh, going on throughout the globe and the fact that uh, here in the U.S., we now have 35 uh, states, I believe it is, with medical cannabis laws on their books and 15 with recreational. Uh, certainly, even the recreational use of cannabis has some interesting medical benefits. Uh, certainly, we're supplementing the endogenous, the internal cannabinoid system, and uh, we're finding that uh, people who are regular cannabis users have a much lower incidence of diabetes, uh, for example, et cetera. So again, even the recreational use is uh, showing some uh, very good uh, long-term health and wellness benefits. Um, yeah, certainly uh, in terms of uh, cannabis legalization, uh, we're a little bit behind what's going on to our neighbor to the north, Canada, and soon we'll be uh, behind what's going on with our neighbor to the south, Mexico, as they look to legalize uh, cannabis uh, for medical as well as recreational use by this time next month. So uh, certainly uh, we need to catch up a little bit in terms of our uh, federal regulations and policy. We're all stuck in this old paradigm of the 1961-1971 single convention treaties on narcotics on an international basis and certainly to get cannabis uh, removed here and uh, able to be studied and researched the way it needs to be, I think is going to 
uh, certainly uh, be a big uh, game changer. But in terms of economies and ec economics, certainly uh, each individual state now, of course, the budgets are strained. Uh, we don't have uh, people working in the workplace and producing all the revenue that we once did with the you know, millions and millions that are unemployed right now. We're all looking for the next government bailout, if you will. But certainly uh, to uh, tax and regulate uh, cannabis and what we've seen with uh, progressive states such as Colorado, I mean, gosh, $300 million a year plus going into state yeah. uh, coffers from tax revenue from uh, $2 billion plus worth of uh, cannabis sales on an annual basis. Uh, certainly that's not being lost among these state treasurers. In fact, I can take it maybe one step further that at some point uh, these uh, treasurers and all might actually want to issue uh, cannabis-backed uh, revenue bonds, uh, for example, and wow. uh, be able to access financial marketplace backing it with uh, cannabis uh, itself or uh, the revenue stream that's coming in from cannabis, be able to securitize this and make it into something that could be uh, openly traded on markets. Uh, many years when I was starting my uh, career, uh, we didn't necessarily have a big mortgage bond market. It was kind of in its infancy, it was being thought about. And now all of a sudden we have these big uh, Fannie Mae's, Ginny Mae's and all that uh, just you know trade billions and billions of dollars every day by pooling these mortgages and certainly uh, to uh, take advantage of this same concept into uh, the cannabis arena, I think is gonna give it a tremendous legitimacy once we get through some of these federal hurdles. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny. You Obviously on this show, we're, it's very skewed towards the positive side of cannabis, but when you look at it, I mean, there, the upside severely outweighs the downside. The upside of what it can do for our country versus what the downside would be, which you know, it, the assumption is that you have more people that are going to consume it and become lazy stoners. But we always make the argument on this show that the people that consume cannabis and are lazy and don't do anything, well, they're more so the second part of that, that they're just lazy people who happen to consume cannabis, as opposed to cannabis putting them in that state, right? So, you know, I think those people are going to find something and they're going to find some excuse to be the person that they are. But I think the upside of legal of federal legalization in this country heavily outweighs any downsides that we have. I'm sure there are plenty of them that I don't see, but I would love to get someone who's much smarter and much more in tune with the industry to, to comment on that. Well, I certainly think uh, some dislocations uh, will happen. Uh, of course, uh, many uh, of us uh, have accepted uh, going to a restaurant or a bar and having a glass or two of uh, alcohol or an adult beverage, as you might call it, uh, mm -hmm. after work, say, on a Thursday or Friday evening and uh, the rest. But uh, you know, long term, uh, alcohol has uh, very detrimental health effects. And certainly uh, consuming cannabis, we think is quite a lot safer, and certainly a, a lot more healthy for you. Uh, similarly, uh, we see a lot of people uh, smoking cigarettes, and it's just an unfortunate uh, situation because they're very negative long term health consequences, and you can get them to switch over to cannabis, which might not contain as much in the way of carcinogens and actually have some uh, medicinal benefit in a roundabout way, if you will, uh, versus smoking cigarettes, I think has got great application now. And they're, in fact, they're coming up with these new hemp smokables, which uh, will deliver a little bit of uh, CBD as well as giving those people who smoke uh, the same uh, action and activity that they're used to with cigarettes. But now all of a sudden, something that's uh, maybe a little bit better for them than the uh, long-term negative effects of uh, tobacco smoking. So uh, those type of dislocations uh, certainly are things that are not being lost among very large companies uh, such as uh, Philip Morris, the big tobacco giant, or even Constellation Brands, the big alcohol and spirits manufacturer. And they've invested four billion plus US dollars into Canopy Growth Corp because yeah. they foresee the day when you and I can go into a restaurant and we can either get an alcoholic beverage or a cannabis-based, a THC-based beverage. And if we had a choice of one or the other, I think about 50% plus of Americans would favor the cannabis-based beverage. I, I don't disagree with you. In fact, I think two weeks ago, we had an entire panel dedicated to cannabis-based beverages. And it's amazing because on that panel, we had uh, a, a, a seltzer, a fruit tonic, a wine, and a beer 
all that were either brewed from or had cannabis in it. And to me, that's the future. I mean, listen, I, I talk on this show, I, I like to smoke joints, but I don't believe that's a future public consumption method, right? You know, as well as I do that this country has spent a lot of time and effort taking smoke out of public places. And I don't think they're in any rush to put it back, but there is going to be some kind of public delivery mechanism. Um, and I think beverages are, are definitely that, at least in my assumption. Right. It's uh, certainly exciting to uh, see these new and up and coming um, forms of delivery that uh, really are going to be a lot more socially acceptable. Uh, it was something that uh, when we broke into the uh, CBD industry, um, we knew we couldn't really uh, bring something that would be a smokable necessarily to the markets. We had to make it something that maybe a parent would be able to give to a child who had epilepsy or uh, autism or some other uh, disorder and uh, as well as have it available for senior citizens, et cetera. And so to come up with these nice uh, mixtures now, these finished oil products maybe mixed with an MCT, a medium chain triglyceride oil, such as a coconut oil, have them in capsules, topical application products as well. Uh, certainly this has moved the dialogue quite significantly uh, away from the traditional stigma of the cannabis uh, hippie. Yeah. Well, let, let me ask you an interesting question here, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of talk, and, and I think you're, you're aware of this topic, of a psychedelics use in, in helping with mental health, right? That, that's very big right now. I can tell you between myself and people I've spoken to that full form cannabis, we'll call it adult use for now with THC in it, um, that you could leverage that for mental health. I can tell my personal experience and the way that I've felt about it is when I consume it, it really does help me with introspection and seeing things from a different perspective, right? And my wife jokes that that cannabis is my therapist because it gets me to think about the things that a therapist would think about, right? And I just, I guess maybe studying psychology, I, I get to that place on my own, but is there a place for cannabis with THC just so we can clarify in helping with mental health and in that world as well as psychedelics? Yes, I, I'm very excited about the up and coming uh, psychedelics uh, marketplace and market arena. Uh, the fact that many people are now able to microdose the psychedelics, uh, certainly, there have been tremendous stories, just you know, people anecdotally who you know, suffered with uh, depression and other mental disorders for years and years on all kind of pharmaceutical medications, seeing psychologists, et cetera. And just one dose, interestingly enough, just seems to be able to hit the reset button for some of these individuals and jumpstart the um, brain chemicals, uh, the, those neurotransmitters that we normally naturally produce and change the way that the individual produces these brain chemicals and producing much more of what's called serotonin. Uh, this is a neurotransmitter in the brain and uh, certainly the psychedelics seem to hit a particular receptor site that does help the body to produce more of this serotonin. This confers feelings of well-being, happiness, and uh, elevates uh, people's mood uh, when it's available in abundance. And we can produce it naturally um, in our brains, if we can uh, tune in and, and uh, get ourselves to that uh, place and state of mental health and uh, fulfillment and, and whatever else in our lives that allow us to uh, experience these great levels of neurotransmitter release. And uh, certainly this is uh, something we're uh, looking at the, the science and research. There's another serotonin receptor that does seem uh, CBD has a peripheral effect upon. And uh, from some of our study and research, we've seen individuals elevating their levels of serotonin. But it's interesting when you combine, say, CBD along with psilocybin, that you get both receptors in this serotonin <laughs> network working. And I think uh, potentially that could be one of the great um, uh, bits of study and research to come down the, the line. And there's one company out there that's studying that right now. It's uh, certainly uh, quite exciting. But going back to your point uh, earlier about how cannabis is able to uh, confer great feelings of, of wellness or introspection or whatever. I think some of the greatest music in the history of the world was written uh, with a, a cannabis a joint or two uh, being utilized in combination with. It just seems for some people to stimulate that creativity that's latent within us, but it's able to now bring it to the forefront uh, in, in terms of at least 
music, uh, music writing, uh, maybe uh, culture, and um, certainly believe that there's a great place uh, for uh, these uh, cannabinoids and these uh, psychedelics to work very uh, complementary to each other. Uh, that's very interesting. And even on that last point about, you know, some of the best music being written a after a few joints, I think we can say the thing. I'm a huge stand up co comedy fan. I think we can say the same for some of the greatest comedies. I mean, look at Jim Belushi on his farm talking about the smell of SNL, right? So it it's led to some great creations in our culture for sure. Um, you know, this is a question that probably, you know, if I was a, more of a traditional broadcaster, if you will, I should have asked you more at the beginning of our interview. But one of the things you had mentioned, and we, we glossed over it, but I've talked to it with the, the few doctors that have been on this show, is the endocannabinoid system, right? Uh, or endocannabinoid system. I'm, I'm not great with pronunciation, but this is not something that's taught in medical schools, but it's a very, you know, integral system in the body. And I, I always make the reference, it's like teaching a mechanic how to work on an engine, but leaving out the electrical system, right? You're, you're, you're leaving out a major part that could affect other things. You know, how far are we away from our medical schools adopting teaching this or at least recognizing it and talking about it? Because I, I, I don't want to say that our doctors are at a severe disadvantage because obviously modern medicine does a great job. We're living longer than we, we were, but I feel like... I actually heard this in an interview of you saying that most people learn about the endocannabinoid system from a friend or the internet and not their doctors. So how do we get to a place where it's not that way, where it's your doctor that's educating you on it? Uh, well, that's a wonderful point. Certainly uh, we're operating, unfortunately, in this 1940s uh, paradigm, if you will, of medicine. And uh, even though the endocannabinoid system was discovered, in 1988 to today, there are over 10,000 articles on PubMed at our National Institutes of Health regarding this internal endogenous cannabinoid system. It still is not being widely taught. However, there are uh, schools who are now teaching more in the way of cannabis science. Um, other schools are looking at the analytical side, the laboratory side, and preparing their students for uh, cannabis uh, analytical uh, practices because you're going to be needing to identify not only all your uh, cannabinoids that are in uh, a plant, certainly, but also any residual pesticides and other uh, heavy metals, et cetera. And some of these uh, pesticides are not generally harmful if they're in agriculture and something that we're just normally going to consume and eat. But all of a sudden, when you smoke them or heat them to a certain level, they become very, very toxic to the human body. So uh, there's a great bit of research uh, and study going on on this side that actual uh, universities are now starting to prepare the students for uh, courses in cannabis analytical chemistry. And I uh, couldn't be more excited about that side progressing as well as just some of the normal education to the medical doctors. I think it'll start probably with continuing medical education, but then soon we'll see uh, universities actually giving courses and giving classes in terms of cannabis science and cannabis medicine. Certainly for a doctor, uh, the doctor of the future is going to need to be very well-rounded and very much more well-versed in terms of the knowledge and information that a current bud tender might have in them. <laughs> You know, it's it's interesting. We're advancing medicine by looking to the past. It's like we all of a sudden said, hey, we should go pick up where we left off when they outlawed this thing and just, you know, move it forward. Um, the, the conversation has been awesome. A lot of it, not a lot of it, but a lot of it over my head, just trying to keep up with you and learn everything. I love these conversations because this is the side of the business and side of the plant that I think people really need to understand the actual benefits of it, not just Listen, I love all the companies out in California are doing great with branding and everything else, but that's the side of the business that people expect. This is the side that is the future for me. So again, as someone who is very involved in having both a finance and, an, and a healthcare background, what are some of the things maybe in 2021 and beyond that you see on the horizon, whether it's from a healthcare standpoint or even from a, legislation, a legislative standpoint that are exciting to you that we should all be looking at? Well, I think the, the most exciting thing certainly is that the uh, potential of new uh, incoming administration has been very uh, vocal in terms of the legalization of uh, cannabis, certainly uh, Vice President or Vice President-elect uh, Camilla Harris uh, has uh, been uh, very much in 
favor of cannabis uh, legalization. And certainly this could be a tremendous uh, game changer for those of us within the industry uh, to get uh, people uh, who are cannabis-based employees right now working at dispensaries, actually be able to get them uh, a regular paycheck and uh, for banking to come forth uh, to remove some of this crazy um, 280E, the IRS uh, tax uh, regulations, which don't allow for the normal deductions that a normal business can take. Um, uh, certainly to make this more of a uh, normal uh, industry and the uh, great potential it has to stimulate economic growth, I think is really something very, very much needed. Uh, we have the potential to employ millions of Americans in this industry, either on the THC side and uh, cannabis as the legalization of uh, medical cannabis uh, grows uh, significantly through the country on the recreational side, and then hemp as well. We're just you know, barely scratching the surface of some of the amazing industrial applications. Uh, things such as hemp building materials, hemp construction, hemp board, hemp concrete, more importantly, hemp insulation. That's going to revolutionize the way we think about keeping our houses uh, you know, warm in winter and cool in summer. And certainly uh, the biomass for biofuel, your clean burning ethanol, methanol is going to be a tremendous game changer. Uh, your um, hemp textiles certainly uh, being a lot more friendly, uh, environmentally friendly way than cotton, which uses 25% of the world's agricultural chemicals, and then a new emerging concept of hemp batteries. Imagine running your Tesla wow. car on a hemp battery, uh, particularly with these hemp supercapacitors where, you know, you run down, your tank is uh, gone, you've gone your 250 miles or whatever on your Tesla car, well, you pull into a filling station, boom, a quick 20-second charge with these hemp supercapacitors that can be developed, and boom, you're back on the road for another 250 miles with a 20-second charge. So certainly... This has uh, the application to uh, fully revolutionize the way we uh, do business here in America, get us off this oil-based economy and get us into a more sustainable, renewable economy that certainly will employ millions and millions of Americans and really pick us up out of this you know, unfortunate situation where we're all looking at the looming depression and uh, you know, if it wasn't for the government bailing everybody out, we'd be in a horrible state right now. Certainly, uh, we look forward to being able to employ those people uh, gamefully in the private sector of the economy. And certainly the whole cannabis movement, look at uh, hemp, uh, marijuana, uh, THC, et cetera. I mean, this certainly has the opportunity to do it. Again, we're just barely scratching the surface in this whole industry. It, it's crazy. I think unofficially we can almost say that for every, almost every issue facing this country, there is a way that cannabis can solve it, you right? A solution for it. There really, really is. It's absolutely amazing. The, the plant's just so versatile. Oh, they, it, it's crazy. I mean, you, you mentioned the, the car and having cars running off of cannabis or hemp batteries. And, you know, as I understand it, the Model T originally had hemp fenders that were stronger than steel. So we're going to have a car made out of hemp with hemp seats, you know, hemp leather, and it's going to be powered by hemp. It's going to, I think I saw something on LinkedIn of a fully hemp car. You're going to drive that to your hemp houses. I mean, it, it wearing your hemp clothing, it's going to be absolutely incredible. And I think this is a future I'm very excited about. Well, for sure. I know uh, the auto industry has uh, kind of taken the, the lead, if you will, over in the European community, because many cars and other dashboards and door panels are all made from hemp uh, biocomposite material, hemp bioplastics. Uh, so currently, uh, you can uh, purchase a car with a great amount of hemp in it uh, if you go over to the European community. And certainly uh, that technology can easily be taken here to the U.S. And I'm sure before too long, we'll see some very nice and sustainable um, biocomposite material coming from plants. Well, I hope to continue to see you doing interviews on the major news networks because, you know, I, I think people sitting at home to hear things like this and hear what the future of this plant and the possibilities for this country could be just by legalizing it, they're, they're exciting, they're inspiring, right? Especially when you look at the news today and all the negativity to hear things like this that can be worked on and can be a solution for a lot of problems, I think should excite anybody. And, you know, I, I hope you continue to spread the message. It's been exciting. So, you know, obviously you, you are a wealth of information, but you're also a business leader and you're a leader in the industry that you're in. Um, before we let you go and turn you loose, talk to us about where we can find your products, what's 
some of your favorite products are. And then again, I've seen a few interviews with you recently that you guys are focusing a lot on CBN for sleep. So just give us a little summary about that and where we can find it. Well, great. Thank you. Our uh, website, uh, <clears throat> medicalmarijuanainc.com. And for those who are uh, in the stock market or to trading every so often or ticker symbol, MJNA. Uh, we have uh, three uh, prominent uh, sales divisions, uh, hemp meds uh, being one. And uh, I certainly have uh, been involved uh, with hemp meds since its outset, the spring of 2012, selling our first uh, nutraceutical hemp-based CBD products on US and world markets. We have a very high concentration product, our oral applicator product, uh, gold oral applicator, 24% concentration of CBD. Uh, we have a blue that's a 17% and a green, which contains CBD in its acid form, about a 12% concentration. So those are some of my favorite products. Of course, we have liquid products, capsules, topical application products too. Very excited about the application for uh, topical um, situations with people with say uh, musculoskeletal discomfort, uh, for example, and other uh, issues. I certainly believe that the ingestible as well as the topical products are wonderful. Uh, one of our other uh, subsidiaries, Canaway, has such a tremendous international reach. Uh, we're in the European community, we're over in Russia, we're in Japan and uh, Vietnam at the moment, and just going through a soft launch process in the country of Mexico. So very much international very cool. organization. And of course, we've just launched the CBN product you were talking about, the cannabinol, uh, which uh, does seem to be the most sedating of all the cannabinoids and uh, certainly uh, getting good sleep is part of an overall health and wellness program. I mean, let's go to sleep at night, but we don't get that real deep, restful state of sleep. But uh, once we start to experience that, uh, we really kick in various processes within the brain that allow the brain to flush and detoxify all the um, <clears throat> toxic waste that the brain cells produce throughout the day. So it's only at sleep at night when we can flush those brain toxins, that beta amyloid. There was just a nice study uh, out today uh, showing that uh, Alzheimer's patients who uh, do not sleep well at night, do not get into deep restful states of sleep are gonna have much more accumulation of this toxic protein called beta amyloid, which is really the characteristic or the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. So if we can get those patients to start to sleep better at night, get into that deep restful, uh, REM state of sleep, or your deep brain waves kick in, all of a sudden these uh, cleaning up processes, this uh, fluid uh, will go through the brain and just allow for the removal of these toxic waste products that we produce throughout the day. Of course, we have trillions of brain cells in, uh, in, in our, our brain and throughout the body, of course, and these cells all produce a little bit of toxic waste as they do their normal daily processes. And Throughout our body, we have a wonderful lymphatic system that flushes these toxins normally throughout the day. Our movements and our activities help flush this fluid, but in the brain, it's only when you're asleep at night do you do this detoxification process. So sleep is extremely important, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to do some more study and research to prove the benefits, and maybe someday some pharmaceutical company will have a CBN-based sleep drug on marketplace. Well, I'm excited for the future of this. And for sure, we're going to have to have you back on to pick your brain again in the near future. Dr. Titus, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I certainly look forward to coming back in the near future. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody at home for watching. This has been another episode of Elevate Your Grind. Join us again tomorrow live at 6.30 p.m. right here at facebook.com slash Group. And if you missed any part of this interview, it will be live on our YouTube page. I want to say two weeks, but we might have caught up, so it might be next week. Don't quote me on that. We'll make sure we make an announcement. But that's going to be at youtube.com slash Elevate Your Grind. Folks, this has been another episode of Elevate Your Grind. We're out.